It looks like a picture-perfect day in the Comoros Islands. But there is trouble in the air. U.S. Ambassador Frank Huddle and his wife Chanya are two of 175 people on board Ethiopian Flight 961 when it literally falls out of the sky and crashes into the Indian Ocean. But what brings this flying machine down is no accident. It's being hijacked by three desperate Ethiopian men seeking political asylum. They've stormed the cockpit and claimed to have a bomb. They want to fly to Australia, and unless their demands are met, they will blow their plane up. Captain Lul Abate was at the controls of Flight 961. It was originally scheduled to fly to Kenya. That's a two and a half hour flight. There was some reserve fuel, but the hijackers had already kept the plane in the air for four hours. The captain knew he was running out of fuel, and worse, out of time. I told the hijacker, we're running out of fuel. Shortly, we're going to lose the engines. You have to let me land at this airport. Otherwise, we're all dead people now. He said, that's what I want. I never for a moment thought that there would be anybody in his right mind sitting there watching a fuel gauge going down in quantity and letting it go to empty, you know. Captain Jonas Mekoria was second in command. I just didn't think this was possible. Now, for the first time on television, these two brave men recount the downing of Flight 961. I told the, uh, the lead hijacker, Guy, we have 30 minutes to leave. Unless you allow me to land and refuel, we cannot make it to Australia. The only option we have is to die in the sea. I was beginning to be anxious because I knew we were beginning to run out of fuel at that point in time. And right there, sure enough, the airplane just sort of jolted to one side. And I knew it was an engine that just failed. The 767 is perfectly capable of flying with one engine, but not without fuel. We reached something like 21,000 feet and the second engine also went dead. And I told the passengers, we're planning for a crash landing. The whole cabin was just dead silent. The pilots ran out of fuel at 21,000 feet. The 150 ton 767 is still moving at more than 200 miles an hour, but falling out of the sky at 2,000 feet per minute. The pilots can glide using the flaps, but falling at that rate, they can only glide for 40 miles. The closest land was the Comoros Islands. A water landing was his only option and putting it down next to a crowded beach was his passenger's best chance at survival. I was sure I was not going to make it to the airport. So my last option was just to go over the beach where rescue was available. With the altimeter dropping fast, all 175 brace for the inevitable. It's a heart-stopping scene as the jet slams into the water at 200 miles an hour, cartwheels and shatters. At first, it was a kind of a smooth touchdown sort of a thing, but then everything was just very rough. It was violent, you know, and I believe that's the moment where everything just broke apart. Within seconds, tourists turn rescuers from a nearby resort begin plucking bodies from the watery wreckage. All three hijackers were killed on impact. But Captain Abate's split-second decision to ditch so close to the shoreline ultimately saves 50 lives. One of them is Ambassador Frank Huddle. The next thing I knew, I almost heard myself talking. I said, hey, I'm alive. I sort of looked out, and the plane has disappeared. He was thrown 300 feet from the plane, the entire length of a football field. 
All I remember is waking up and imploding in the water in my seat, like a chipmunk in a lawn chair, just sort of bobbing in the water. I looked to my right where my wife had been, and she was gone. My heart sank. Chanya Huddle had flown 50 feet past her husband. Then I heard my husband's voice said, oh, you, you are alive? Or Sorry, I, I am I, alive. I am alive, you know, he said that I'm alive. And I opened my eyes because I heard his noise. Alive with only minor injuries, a miracle considering the airplane hit the water at a bone-crushing 200 miles per hour. And believe it or not, it wasn't the brutal impact that broke the plane apart. As the plane's belly skims across the water, the left engine snags a coral reef just below the surface. That small amount of contact catapults the plane end over end, snapping it like a twig. Raul Abade hadn't been such a really fine pilot, we had all been killed. The Huddles also believe the reason they survived may not have been something they did, but something they didn't do. We heard pop, 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 as all the life jackets inflated in the back because people thought, well, there's going to be a water landing. And my wife said, oh, they shouldn't do this. When the plane hit the water, it flipped over, and you couldn't swim down if you had the life jacket on to get out. The majority of the 125 who died on board Flight 691 drowned because they were trapped inside the fuselage with their life vests on. I felt really sorry. Nobody should have died. We lost so many passengers. I'm really, I still mourn them, still. But there was nothing they could have done. I regret the fact that we didn't do something about it. It was before 9-11. After 9-11, you know, passengers do, don't sit idly. Before 9-11, Ethiopian Flight 691 was the deadliest hijacking in aviation history. At that time, cockpits were much more accessible. Now they are protected by bulletproof doors with keypad entry locks. Flight attendants also stand guard, making it much more difficult to get to the pilots. Because of the heroic actions of the pilots, 50 people came away with their lives. Thank you for calling me a hero, but I don't consider my, myself a hero. I just fulfilled my professional obligation. I don't think of myself as a hero. I just did my job, and I just did what I had to do. Here's a plane where 75% of the passengers were killed, and yet, we both survived. The odds of that mathematically are one in 16, that the husband and the wife survived. So we got a lucky break. At Merced. <laughs>